says this. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, back up to verse 15. Let's uh, get the context. So, as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. These are Christians already, by the way. They're already Christians. But he says, I want to come to you and preach the gospel. You see, when we see the word gospel and read this, preach the gospel, we imagine in our minds what preach the gospel means. You go out here and find a bunch of sinners, you know, a bunch of people who've never heard of Jesus. I go to some faraway country, you know, in some, you know, in, in New Guinea or somewhere, people, you know, uh, wearing a loincloth and, you know, and eating nuts off the ground. I don't know what. There's some faraway, uncivilized people and say, here's a bunch of people who've never heard about Jesus. And then we'll preach that. They need to hear the gospel. Paul's talking to Christians. He said, you need to hear the gospel. Did you get that? He says, I want to come to you at Rome. This is not some, uh, some jungle somewhere. This is Rome, the center of the empire, civilized, the height of civilization, and a church there. And he says, I am ready to come to you and preach the gospel. Now, see, what Paul meant by preach the gospel is something different. We think preach the gospel means convince somebody to get converted. But for Paul, he says, the word gospel is what we call gospel. This word is actually a modern version of an old English word, which actually means good speech good news in other words and what Paul that's the way Paul's thinking I've got some good news for you even though you're already Christians and you already believe it, I say, I've got something that you need to hear and it's good news now you need to keep this in mind he says I've got gospel good news gospel means good news I've got good news and I want to come and tell it to you that are at Rome verse 16 says for I'm not ashamed of the good news the gospel of Christ now notice first of all that the good news, the gospel of Christ, notice that it is of Christ. That means it's about Christ. It's a message, and the reason it's good news is it's about, well, you might be sitting there thinking, well, what else would it be about? Oh, well, you know what What else we hear about? The competing message would be about you. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and then Elliot and Anton, seven, eight. Uh, six, there are eight of us here this morning. Now, you might think, you know, I get together with preachers sometimes. I try not to, but sometimes I have to. And uh, what they all, the topic of conversation, listen, I'll tell you, the, the topic of conversation among preachers is this. You want to know what they talk about? You want to know what preachers talk about behind closed doors? I'll tell you. They, it just, it, they, they're, they're just torn up inside over this. The town of Alva has X number of thousands of people, and more people are sitting at home on Sunday morning than are in church. How and they're just they're just consumed with this, upset about this. There are more people out here at home mowing the grass or watching TV than you know watching Firing Line or something on television than are here in church. And just how can we get them in church? You know why why that is? I'll tell you why it is because people are afraid that when they go to church they're going to hear about something that's going to make them feel bad. That the person the preacher is going to stand up here and start talking about bad behavior, and they're going to say, "Oh, I've done that. Oh, I've done that too. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. sorry. I'm guilty." You know, and leave feeling worse. Paul here says, "I've got good news." Now, see, if you come to church and hear about you and your behavior in your life, that's going to be bad news. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it that way, but, but but listen, that's the only reason for bringing it up. <laughs> but see, I'm glad, and and this is one reason I never I never. Uh, 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 feel bad or regret uh, being able to stand up here, I'm looking forward to it because I've got good news. I found out that the message we're supposed to convey is not bad news, but good news. Look, I'm just like you. I don't like to sit out there and, and be made to feel bad. No. But Paul here says the message is good news and it's because it's about Christ. Now, let me just back up just for a second and talk about this letter, this letter to the Romans. Paul has kind of a structure, kind of a pattern. And uh, when I began to see this and understand it, it helped me tremendously to understand how he organized, like this letter to the Romans, for instance. It's, it's typical in, in some ways, and atypical in other ways, but what Paul ordinarily does is he spends the first half of his epistles talking about what he considers to be the gospel. And then the second half he talks about application of it. How do you apply the gospel? But you know, in the first half, when he's talking about what he calls the gospel, you don't ever find him telling anybody to do anything. He never says, you ought to be doing this, you ought to be doing that. He never says, you need to turn over a new leaf. He never says, you need to try better. He never says, you read or do anything. He only tells you about Christ and about what he has done for you. That's why it's good news. See, what if I came to you and I said, uh, I called you up on the phone and said, uh, or oh, no, let's don't say me. Let's say, what if your bank called you up on the phone and said, I've got good news for you. Uh, a rich uncle, you didn't even know you had. A rich uncle died and he left you $10,000. What would you say? Oh, well, 
I'm indifferent. I'm indifferent. No, you'd be dancing up and down. You'd be th- wouldn't you be thrilled? That's good news to, say, to hear that someone has done something for you. See, even if, even if, especially if it's unexpected and didn't know, you know, wow, I can't believe it. You know, you'd be thrilled. Wouldn't you be, a, I mean, like we say on cloud nine, you know, you, you couldn't keep it, you know, quiet about it. See, that's the way this is. It's the gospel of Christ, and it's a message about what he has done for you. And here again, I like to say, 2,000 years later, after the fact, I say many people, like Rome here, he says, I want to come and preach the gospel. Many Christians say, don't really fully know what's been done for them. You know what most people, I think, think the Christian life is? A bunch of things you're supposed to do. A bunch of requirements, a bunch of rules, a bunch of behaviors, just a code of ethics, things for you to do. It's not about things for you to do. It's about what Christ has done for you. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel notice of Christ. It's about Christ. So that's the first thing to notice. It's good news because it's about Christ. Then he says, for it, that is this message about what Christ has done for you. He says, it is the power of God unto salvation. What that means is it is the power of God resulting in salvation. To everyone, listen to this, to everyone that does what? See that next word? Believes. Now, in church world and in different branches of the church world, People like to put all kinds of requirements. Well, you've got to do this. Well, you've got to do this other thing. And denominations could be divided up into what they say the other things you've got to do are. You know, And I don't even want to get into the specifics. But you notice Paul here didn't add anything to it. He said, it is the power of God resulting in salvation to everyone that believe it. With nothing else added. Now, there's all kinds of good things we can do. We can take communion. That's a good thing. We do that sometimes. But that is not going to say, Paul doesn't say it for everyone that believes and takes the communion every week. Now, in the Middle Ages, that's what they thought. They thought you had to come and, and uh, they called it the Mass. That was the fancy thing for it. And unless you did that, you fell out of right standing with the church. Uh, he doesn't say, to, I don't even want to go into all the, all the different things people say. He doesn't add anything to it. You see that? Everyone that believes, in other words, you could say it this way, who embraces it by believing in it, by relying upon it. Well, you might say, well, uh, see, believe means more than just to mentally uh, agree that it could be true. It means to place your trust in it. To tr- I, I read a, a book by a man named J.B. Phillips. And J.B. Phillips is the translator of the New Testament into modern speech called the Phillips Translation. It has his name because he's the translator. And after he did the translation, he wrote a little book about all the things he learned by studying the original languages, the Greek language, and translating the New Testament. And one thing that he discovered that he thought was a really good thought was um, in delving into what does the New Testament mean when it says believe? Because people wonder, well, how do I know if I'm believing? He said, when the New Testament is talking about believing, what the idea behind the word is, it means uh, more than just to agree that something is true, it means to place your confidence in it. And he said it this way, it, to believe means for a man to transfer his confidence from himself to Christ. And that's really insightful, what he said, because many people they are really, when you get right down to it, they are relying upon themselves and their own behavior to make them right with God. You find that out by talking. When you finally can ever get down and talk to serious, about serious things with people, about, you know, uh, about life and death kind of issues, sometimes people will say, well, I just hope I've done enough good things. <laughs> you know, if a person, if you say, I, I hope I've done I, 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 that's a clue. If, if I have done enough good things, that means you're trusting in yourself. I put it this way sometimes, you know, have you ever seen the little cartoons where somebody dies and he's standing before the gate of heaven and St. Peter's standing there? It's not like that. St. Peter's not a guard at the gate of heaven. But let's just say, for the sake of this little uh, illustration, let's just say that's true. Let's just say you've died and you're standing before the gate of heaven and St. Peter says, why should I let you in here? If you say, I tried to do my best, I tried to do this, I did and start naming off all your good deeds, that means you're trusting in yourself. You see? You're not believing in Christ if you're trusting in yourself. But if in that scenario you would say, I have got nothing to commend myself except I put all my faith in Jesus. He's my Savior. That's the right answer. That means you're trusting wholly in Christ, you see. And so Paul here says, the gospel, the good news about Christ and what you see, that's the only way to respond to a message about what Christ has done for you is to say, I put my trust in what He did for me in relation to God. The gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes. It's for everyone who does nothing more than to trust in it and to rely upon it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, now, this word salvation, 